or the process that need to be complied with when recruiting an employee who is required to be a FIRES representative and all the process that needs to be complied with when recruiting an employee on a temporary basis and fixed term. And all the process that are required to be complied with when recruiting a foreign national. And all the process that are need to be complied with when seconding an employee, whether within or outside PIC, as well as the process that needs to be complied with regards to promotions. So what the recruitment process actually provides both policy and procedural format that needs to be followed, and that's what I'm going to deal with the next, next part, which is on section uh, five to nine of the recruitment and selection policy. Can we just, can we just stop there? What are, are the special requirements when a person applies for a job where a phase is applicable? Yes, uh, Commissioner, the special requirements that the person has to be um, compliant with the requirements specifically with regards to the process and product and the advice that they will need to provide. So it means that they will have to be accredited um, to do so. So an examination normally will be um, done, um, RE1, RE2, uh, depending on the product and the advice that the incumbent would be providing. So most employees who are in that position, um, whether you're a key individual or a key representative, would need to go through that qualification criteria before you could provide the service. Um, in relation to the criteria, given that you have a CEO that has resigned, has there been a, a uh, an advert or a job description or whatever you call that proposal to advertise for a new CEO? Do you have something that has been drawn up? longer in my response to that. Perhaps maybe just deal particularly with the issue of when you advertise a position. In essence, um, you'd need to, and we refer to in the process here, as you'll notice on step one, vacancy request, which particularly deal with filling in a vacant position. In there, I would engage with a line manager, and in this instance, it would be the board, um, or the, the shareholder. Has that been done? Not yet. In terms of the current dispensation, not yet, um, with respect to the current situation that we're in. Um, there, it will be articulated in terms of specific competencies that you know, we'll be looking at uh, that fulfill the role um, that, that needs to be recruited for. Is that competency determined or by the shareholder or by the board or by both? It, it could be by both, but in essence, it would be by board um, in consultation with the shareholder if there are specific requirements that need to be included in those competencies. But as I understand from the notes um, that I've read is that the appointment of these positions is actually the shareholder in consultation with cabinet. That's, that's correct. Um, the, so the board would make a proposal and a recommendation. The interview process will be um, also conducted um, by the shareholder, but they'll make a recommendation. Um, I mean, the, the board will make a recommendation in terms of whether the shortlisting process. Um, it could be that the uh, chairperson of the uh, is, is also delegated to do so, uh, or the chairperson of the board may also take it upon themselves. But obviously, this has to be within um, the PIC. And if there's anything on the requirements of the job, um, um, the HR department will have to be involved in drawing up that job specification and description. Um, because you know um, the CEO reports and, and is an employee of, of PIC, so that has to be within that organizational structure. From a process point of view, in terms of appointments and, and the likes, the shareholder obviously would then make the determination of the successful candidate. They will and may participate in the interview process as well. So on step one, um, as the, the, the commissioner had asked on around the vacancy request, um, positions are advertised, the position that's vacant, then shortlisted, and the screening process would also ensue. 
psychometric and competence-based assessment when applicable will also uh, be looking at. And then an interview session will also um, um, uh, proceed. The successful candidate, if they meet all the requirements of the role, would therefore be recommended for appointment and the approver would therefore uh, appoint. Um, in that instance, you know, the HR would compile and make a recommendation. Then we also have to ensure that, you know, from a posting and budget cost of that role, we've adequately budgeted for it and the finance department would sign also in that respect. And the final approver, whoever it, it would be in line with the delegation of authority would do so. On page five, um, <coughs> Chairperson, you'll notice that I'm dealing particularly with one of the areas, and I think I had an engagement with the lead investigator in around some of the appointments, and I just dealt initially in the last one with the um, executive head of investment management. Now the position that I'll be dealing with is in respect of in investor relations and the application process. Um, if this person was advertised, yes, the person was advertised internally on the 7th of March in 2018, and interviews were conducted on the 22nd of March 2018, and the appointment was approved on the 27th of March. I've made reference to um, documentary evidence in that respect for the memo that approved the permanent appointment of the investor relations position in that regard. Question? When you appoint people, do you look sort of internally only, or do you look at externally, and what drives the process of both internal and external uh, so, yeah. process? So, so from a recruitment policy, we would advertise both internally and externally. We would give internal employees a preference um, so that we are in line with ensuring that we promote our internal talent and more so that there is a, a quicker process of um, you know, being part of the culture within PIC and knowledge of that. But that does not disadvantage any external applicant to any position that we advertise. Um, it would be the panel members in terms of the decision making the selection process that will consider if any of the applicants meet the requirements of the role and that is normally done through interviews and there are scoring and they score independently. And the highest candidate or the, the candidate that gets the highest score normally will be recommended for appointment. So there are um, both instances where internally and external candidates may compete for the position at the, the same time. What is the rate of staff turnover? Um, and very, I mean, if you've got the differential between your senior management levels and lower levels? So we, we under the period, period under the review, I would say the current turnover on the senior management, I think we alluded to that. I may need to qualify, you know, in terms of how we would calculate the turnover. The incidence of um, dismissal and disciplinary, we would flag it but turnover would look at your normal voluntary resignation um, uh, as a key determination in terms of whether the employees, um, from a retention point of view, you know, and the brand point of view, um, would, would then leave the organization. Dismissal are an event that is unforeseeable, um, as well as if employees are deceased during their career. So there are instances where those would be excluded in our calculation. But in general, we would then consider voluntary resignation as a determination of turnover. The PIC currently was an overall staff was under 10% um, by the 31st of, of, of December in, in 2018. Um, the turnover, and I'm now indicating with um, the uh, EXCO team or senior management, if you like, will probably be lower than that if I exclude the, 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 the dismissals and the dismissal hearing. If you include the dismissals, what is that? Because obviously dismissals throughout the organization, not just at the senior level, what would the turnover be? If I include all of them? Yeah. It will be slightly higher than, than the norm. I think it would probably be ranging between 15 to 20%. Yeah. 
If that is correct, you're really saying that if it's between 15 and 20 percent, if we took the upper level, you would say the normal voluntary staff turnover is 10 and the dismissals is 10. Yeah, well, if I look at the numbers, so if I can maybe indulge the um, Commissioner, so we have, just want to look at the PIC headcount as a stage. I will forward the information um, as it were. At the 31st of December, we had close to about um, 405 employees in total within PIC. Um, in, in terms of the distinction on the, the permanent, where is the permanent? So the permanent will be 347. Um, the other would consist of um, uh, other temporary employees and, and um, uh, employees that participate on our graduate program, which we refer to as the peak seats. So, so if we're working on the number 347, you know, your, your, your 10 percent will probably constitute close to around about um, 34 or so. And if it will be 20 percent, it will be slightly higher in and around 68 thereabout. But the point I'm just asking is that if we're working on the 347, the voluntary resignations is about 10 percent, and if we include dismissals, you're saying between 15 and 20 percent. So the dismissals are, if we take the upper range of what you're saying, 20 percent, your voluntary resignations and your dismissals are almost equal. Is that well, correct? Look, I, th I think I, I would need to, to check that. I won't if you can indicate, check it, yes, I just yeah. think that yeah. you know, if you're saying it would be useful just to know. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I would, I would probably think, you know, the, the dismissal will be more on the conservative side vis-a-vis -vis the voluntary resignation. Okay. Yeah. May I continue? I was on page uh, five, um, and now I'm dealing with the aspects that is with remuneration, which I believe was also a subject of terms of reference. <clears throat> the PIC follows the remuneration policy and process when determining the remuneration of employees. Uh, it also un, uh, ensured that the uh, remuneration policies are attached on an extra J1. The following are some of the key features in the remuneration policy. policy. Um, section 10. This section indicates the salary benchmark that the PIC will utilize that is each position shall be graded based on the Patterson uh, grading scale. In section uh, 12 on the policy, this section indicates the components of the remuneration structure versus the guaranteed remuneration, which would be the cost to company. So PSC uses the cost to company um, um, formula for, for salaries and fringe benefits. This would also include um, another component, which is the variable remuneration, in this instance, incentives or bonuses. Section 12, uh, the section governs the principle that will be adhered to when determining cost to company for all employees. Um, <clears throat> so when it looks at annual increases, you'll notice that in section 12.1.3 of the policy, which I've um, taken the liberty of extracting a table from the policy on page six, that's table one. PIC follows a uh, a high-performance, uh, values-driven culture. You'll notice on the uh, extreme left of the table uh, is an indication of performance rating, uh, as well as on the two uh, columns on the extreme right, it will be a percentage increases that will be applicable. So these will be in accordance to the percent, I mean, a, a rating um, obtained by the employee and what uh, percentage increase would that employee uh, obtain if increases were to be awarded. We've also looked at what you probably may not understand, A1 to E2. Those are our grades. In other words, employees are graded in terms of their job. A1 would be the lowest grade within the organization. And uh, F5, will, F5 plus or F5 or G 
would be the highest grade. In this instance, the table indicates A1 to A2, what percentage increases are applicable, and on E3 to uh, F5, what percentage increases are applicable. You will notice that immediately when you look at the ratings, that uh, performance rating of 2 to 2.99, um, there is no allocation of increases for any employee that gets that performance rating. And from performance rating 3 uh, right up to 5, um, you will notice that there is an applicable um, uh, performance increase that the employee might get, which would include, and in this respect, a CPI um, from 3, and you'll notice there's a differentiation between A1 to E2 and E3 to E5. So it's a lot more easier on A1 to E2, if I can use that word, to obtain CPI plus a percentage that recognizes that performance at a specific performance level. However, senior roles, E3 to E5, you'll notice that a performance increase, which is uh, uh, that which is above CPI in the applicable year, you would need to obtain a score of at least between 4 and 4.19 or 4 and 5 to be able to get any CPI plus an applicable increase percentage. The maximum thereof is CPI plus 5%. So this governs the allocation in terms of um, increases that apply in PIC. Sorry, can, I just, oh. can I just ask you, if you had to give us an example of um, an F5 CPI plus five percent, which would be the maximum somebody could earn. Yes. One would assume. What would that total be? So it would be the inflation rate as applicable. So what we we'll use on the CPI is that we we'll use the CPI as declared by the Reserve Bank on the 31st of sure. March of every financial year, and a five percent um, of. Now I want the actual rate. number. If you took CPI at 5% yeah. and you said you added 5%, so a 10% So if increase, CPI, for example, is 4%, then the total increase would be 9%. Yes, but 9% on what? If on, you're talking about an on, F5... On the total guaranteed pay. Yeah, but what I want to ask is what is that amount? Well, what I'd is have the to maximum look at, in money terms that yeah. a person would get if they were uh, F5, CPI plus 5%, so let's assume it's 4% and 5% yeah. is 9%, what would that take, what would that be as a maximum earning? So the F5, so yeah. there's a, F5 has got a specific amount in yeah. terms of, yeah. So it could be an amount, let's just assume, and I'm making an example, that a total guaranteed pay of a person that earns 5 million is at an F5 level. So the increase would be, um, uh, if CPI was 5, 10%, that would be um, 5 point. 5 million. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the max? I'm, I'm really trying to get from you what is the, the highest guaranteed pay in your organization? Uh, total guaranteed pay is in the highest. So, so the highest earner, let me, let me put that way, the highest earner would be the CEO. Right. Um, and that value, I think at the moment, is close to around six million plus, if not more than that, but I would need to verify that. So if we said it was six million and you added your CPI, it would then be plus five, uh, plus five percent of that, plus, so it's nine percent, so you're talking about another... Um, 600,000. <coughs> yeah? Yes, there are about. Okay. Yeah. Um, two, uh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Polon, two questions. Um, in terms of the grading of the staff, yes. would 5F or what, 4F maybe, would there be people within that, say general managers or, or like 5F is just the CEO? So I'm just asking, could, within the various bands, there are people, just give me some, some, uh, some idea there. Yeah. And then the second one is on, um, if somebody got a three, a, a two, to 2.99 rating, do they get bonuses and all that? No, so yeah. as you notice that on, between the rating of two and 2.99, the employee will not be eligible for an incentive, um, neither will the employee be eligible for a CPI increase in that specific year. Question, the first question, 
So the grade, we use a grading range, which we call broadbanding in essence. Mm -hmm. So uh, grade F to F1, you will find mostly is senior management, and it can be general managers, fund principals, as well as um, the executive heads. The highest grade so far within PICS currently stands is um, grade F5+, plus, which is a G-band, what we refer to as a G-band. Um, and the next highest grade uh, will be F5, and between F1 and F5, you'd find um, senior management and fund principals in that range. Including general managers and the others? That's correct, yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think some of the aspects we've, we've, we've touched with, but I'll just give a, a key highlight. So section 12.14 of the policy indicates that the variable remission will be determined. Below are the key highlights of this section. So section 12.1.15 indicates that for incentive to be allocated to the business or corporate performance, when we refer to business corporate performance, we refer to the PIC balance scorecard, which forms the basis in which um, PIC's performance is evaluated. So for a incentive to be able to be paid, the balance scorecard needs to at least be at a minimum of a three in terms of the rating. And also the other just, aspects. Yeah, a question, just a question. You know, when people talk about the balance scorecard, some people might not understand this. Maybe you could take us briefly through that. Thanks. So the balance scorecard within PIC has got four dimensions, um, which then deals particularly with uh, the uh, strategic imperatives and objectives. Um, one that will have a client focus, that will be the first dimensions. The other one will deal with uh, um, internal business processes. Then the other ones will deal with um, the financial component and learning and growth. The um, principle and concept of the balance scorecard was, uh, I think, um, started by an author, um, Arthur Kaplan, um, and others in terms of the concept. It's a widely used uh, phenomenon of you know, um, measuring performance and different aspects. It moved away from the old principle of looking at financial performance for a business to all these three different dimensions. So yeah. this is the one where you would allocate 20% of the weight to Absolutely. financial, 30% yes, to this yeah. and all that. Yeah. And we'll have specific uh, key performance areas and yeah. key performance indicators that you'll monitor throughout. Okay, that's for the company. What yes. about for the, the employees? The Similarly, the employees have got employees. balance scorecard which are cascaded from the corporate and you'll see that you'll have the overall um, safety heads as well. There will be specific weighting and emphasis depending on the level in which employees are in within, within PIC. But they follow the broad balance scorecard Absolutely, for concept the company. Is. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The other component in, for an incentive to be declared is that the consideration of our net profit and management fees and financial sustainable ratio has to be at a minimum of a 10, post the allocation of the bonus. So that's the, the other consideration in that regard. Um, the other section that deals with the bonus pool allocation shall only be calculated based on the audited financial statements. So it is only until that the financial state statements are audited and we have a result that you can form a basis of that. What's important about that aspect is that the, the, you are able then to calculate what the management fees that, that have been generated in that specific year um, are indicating from a value point of view. And that's when, if there are 10%, and that 10% from our um, determination of the bonus pool would give you an indication of what that bonus pool would be. Um, then the rest just deals with eligibility of short-term incentives and how the short-term incentives are calculated. Similarly with uh, long-term incentives and the elig eligibility thereof and how these are, cal are calculated. These are all indicated in the policy as well as when will the long-term incentives be vesting. Mm -hmm. Second, another, another question? Yes. 
you got vesting uh, somewhere here. Absolutely, yes. V vesting, do you allocate shares to employees? I mean, so uh, we, PIC does not trade uh, as, as, as corporate, if I can put it that way. So, and it doesn't have shares. So we have a cash component. So a percentage of the bonus pool will constitute long-term incentives. In this instance, PIC, we have 64 percent of the uh, total bonus pool constitute the uh, short-term incentives, and uh, 36 uh, will therefore constitute the long-term incentive. For the long-term incentives, is limited to a certain pool of employees uh, that will be graded grade D, five um, right up to the highest level. This is in line with market practice in terms of identifying critical skill skills that participate in long-term incentives. So we use the cash component. The vesting period then is anything from what, three to five years and all? So the vesting period is, of, I mean, the vesting of the LTI from the year of allocation is three years. Um, if an employee performs and meets the requirements, mm -hmm. every year there's an allocation depending on whether that bonus pool has been declared otherwise. Sure, thanks. I'll probably deal with some of the complex issues, particularly which I think have been much of a consternation with regards to remuneration and incentives are pretty much an error that we've been battling with over the past uh, four years in PIC. This then um, starts with the letter um, from, from um, the shareholder in 2014, where a letter was addressed to the chairman of the board indicating that given the current and tight economic environment, government introduced cost containment measures which include, amongst others, moderation in the remuneration and payments bonus. Sorry, where are you where now? Are you in your I'm segment? on 3.1.2. Three? On page seven? Yeah. Okay. 3.1, 2.10. Okay. It starts in 2014, the shareholder. Yeah, okay, yeah. we got you. So we received a letter from, from the minister basically dealing with, with and, and, and I also made reference to a letter earlier on, dealing with how PIC should be um, managing its, its remuneration, in particular respect of um, bonus pools as it were. So, so there's a remuneration policy that we have in PIC which was approved by board and board would have a delegation of authority if we go through that with respect to the bonus pool um, of, of PIC and in this respect we then got an indication from the shareholder in terms of what should happen going forward if we were to allocate um, bonuses and also refer to um, the shareholder compact um, um, that also dealt specifically with how PIC should treat this. I must also indicate that um, th this has been an era that, that was of great consternation and, and it still remains an era that needs to be, to be finalized um, with regards to the acceptable practice between shareholder de you know, determination of bonus pool and board with respect to an entity like PIC. Can uh, you just elaborate what you mean by creating great consternation? So we've, we've had a number of grievances expressed um, also from employees and I would imagine these would probably be directed to management that, you know, bonus pool seem to be reduced every year as it were. Um, and, and we will provide reasons that, you know, the reduction of the bonus pool is not so much related to the performance of PIC, but um, in most cases is influenced by the directive from the shareholder. Um, and, and, and you, you'd go through this process of explaining this in various um, meetings. So, so that's where the, the basis would be. And, and you would have to provide more convincing reasons as to why this is the case. Because employees, and by right, they understand the remuneration policy and they perform in accordance to the expectations. So when an employee performs, they expect to be rewarded adequately as 
espoused by the remuneration policy. Um, however, we've had obviously these um, directives which we must comply with. Um, we need to, but I think it's an area that needs to be to be dealt with, uh, as it were. If, if but, I can say. But that. normally, consternation is diffused by proper communication with employees. Did this happen? So, let me maybe go back to a year. I just don't want to get to it because you don't have the information before. So it's more my my submission. I think in and around 2014, 15, thereabout, um, I think that's where the first area of consternation occurred. So PIC bonuses were paid um, in and around, I think, about uh, July, August, as a general rule. Um, then we got a directive um, with respect to um, what bonus we should be paying from National Treasury. That delayed the payment, and I think that's where if I can use the word angst, started happening um, within, within PIC. Um, and then obviously we'll have staff meetings to explain that you know, there's been a delay, we're still undergoing through a process, we're engaging with National Treasury, and, 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 and as soon as we get approval of that, then that is immediately communicated. What I've sought to do, um, in most times, to indicate you know, what values of those um, um, uh, bonus pool had been approved. What is the reason? If that is the situation, what is the reason? 2018-19, um, so, so there, there was a uh, interpretation issue with regards to the bonus pool that was you know, declared for, for that specific year. Um, <coughs> I think it's more 17, 18. Yeah, um, in, in that respect. So on page nine, uh, Commissioner, you will notice that there's a table there, uh, table two, on um, paragraph 3.2.39, which then provides the history and genesis of the allocation um, of bonuses, where the shareholder has approved and what the policy in terms of the remuneration policy of PIC would indicate at each performance uh, that the PIC would have obtained. Mm -hmm. You will see the figures on in 2015 and 16, um, and, and also 2016 and 17, and 17 and 18. The shareholder approval would be generally a directive. Um, I think recently the shareholder evaluated the uh, performance of the PIC and provided determination of what bonuses should be applicable. Um, and then we got a letter to that effect. We also had an issue in terms of whether, whether the shareholder can determine the bonus pool for the rest of employees. I noticed that um, one of the commissioners um, asked a question whether there's a separate pool between normal employees and an executive. So the bonus pool of PIC is one. Um, so the delay um, was caused by the fact that the uh, executives were not at that time approved to, 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 to be getting the uh, STI. And the as a result of that, we had engaged um, with, with the shareholder as well as the principal to, to deal with that aspect. Then the shareholder gave us permission to pay out the bonuses for the employees. And the um, executive's bonus was withheld. And I think it was paid um, in, in, in December thereabout. Um, a question here. So are you saying that the bonus pool is determined by the shareholder as opposed by the policies of the PIC? What? Uh, what authority does the shareholder rely on in, in terms of putting out the, the bonus pool as a first question? And then the, uh, the let's answer that, that one yeah. first. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner, I think that, that is a matter that needs to be dealt with from a governance point of view. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the board generally would have, um, and this would also fall within the king King, King for um, you know determination terms of remuneration, but the shareholder may express you know a view in terms of, of you know how um, uh, the board may may, may 
de deal with 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 uh, with bonus pool. But in this instance, it may maybe focus on senior management and indicate that you know this will be. It may, I'm just saying the, the the shareholder may focus on senior management. But the board, in terms of how it stands now with PIC from a governance point of view, is the one that determines the overall bonus pool. What needs then to be dealt with is the aspect that deals with senior management. Our policy says in consultation with the shareholder. But so far, um, that consultation has more, in more instances, been a directive in terms of this is the value of the bonus pool in which you should get. So it would be either be reflected as a percentage of the total expenditure and in which has happened in previous years. Um, and, and that presents a problem because when you are you're contracted and you have specific KPIs, um, you want to focus on that which that has been contracted, as it were, uh, for you to be able to determine that. And if Just you had, a, yeah, yeah, continue. Yeah, and if you had to look at the corporate plan, the balance scorecard, and allocate weights, I think it would be best to be able to say, you know, for you, in order for you, and as it happens in most asset management, to say, well, for you to reach this level, this will be your bonus pool. At this performance rate, this will be your bonus pool. So that it is transparent, it's crisp, and everyone knows what is expected. I think the challenge so far is that at the end of the performance year, then, you know, then the bonus is sort of meddled with from a pool and determination point of view. And I can understand and appreciate some of the concerns because naturally PIC is classified as a state-owned entity and therefore it, it needs to be sort of following the rest. Still are we told? One, two, two. All right, all right. Um, how's the levels now? One, two, two, two. Welcome. Any one organization having that level of complexity uh, and most so, you know, we have to follow the asset management and, and balance that with, with the state-owned remuneration guidelines, as it were. Let me, could it be that when the shareholder says they are cutting the bonus pool from, say, 50 to 20 percent, maybe could, be, could it be that they are saying they've given you KPIs and you guys haven't uh, uh, met them? I well, mean, do, do they explain the reasoning yeah. within that directive? I think, Commissioner, that's where lies the challenge, because that explanation comes in at the end. So it would have been a lot more better if you would have the opportunity of dealing with that at the beginning of the contracting phase. I may hasten to say that the 20% in this instance that has been referred to um, um, was referred to as a percentage allocated to our total personal expenditure. Uh, and we still have to understand what that means that in terms of constituting uh, a bonus pool. But equally, you still have to understand what elements on the balance scorecard or KPIs that PIC needs to deal with in order to satisfy that allocation and what informs it. I think that discussion is something that still needs to be, to be followed through. As it were. Yeah, and I'm sure they will deal with, with the letter that caused some problems in terms of saying the minister wrote the letter, the bonus pool was smaller than, you know, was yes. much less than that, but I'm sure that will be dealt with at some point in time. Yeah, Advocate Luke. Yeah. It, it will be dealt with, yes. So the next part that I'll be dealing with is uh, dismissal proceedings. We sort of touched on earlier on today, so I don't be, know if be, that... Before you do, do that, and before we conclude the remuneration part of your testimony, in terms of the in terms of reference of the Commission, the Commission is requested to look at whether there are discriminatory, discriminatory practice with regard to remuneration and performance award of PIC employees. Do you know of any such instances? Um, Commissioner, no, I'm not aware of any discriminatory practices. I'm aware of differentiation with regards to performance. So as, you've, as we've alluded to in, in, in page six, Specific performance rating would indicate what component of, of, of either an increase or incentive 
an employee would, 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 would be eligible for, and we follow the general guidelines. And if in the event that employees are, in any case, dissatisfied with whatever grade that has been assigned to them, we have the grievance procedure that they could follow on and deal specifically with those aspects. And, and that could be a process that would deal with those. But from a discrimination point of view, I'm not aware of. What I can indicate is that the um, awarding and allocation of incentives is a process which is, is quite rigorous, um, where you'd have first the uh, performance management process that will sort of ensue and inform it. We'll have a moderation committee in which employees' performance ratings will be moderated and communication to individual employees would be indicated in terms of the final rating that's allocated. The rating, as I alluded earlier on, determines you know, the bonus and the pool and their share in that pool, depending on the grade in which the employees find themselves in. Um, so, so, so from a process point of view, there's an, and then there's internal audit. So before any payout of incentives is made, internal audit will audit each and every employees if whether the calculation thereof you know, is in line with the policy or is in line with what they will be eligible for um, in that point of view. What then happens is that um, calculation is confirmed and individual amounts are allocated to individuals and individuals are given letters. I just want to deal with another aspect from a governance point of view. Um, HR will compile that this is the bonus pool and then it gets approved by uh, the human resource. Human resource would then refer it to board. Board you know, would then approve what is, is this. Then we then allocate. Um, the overall approval, so finance will confirm budget available, then the CEO would also confirm approval to pay out incentives as well. So that is the process. Thank you. The next. But is the, is the allocation your responsibility, HR's responsibility? That's correct. So we, we do the, the, the calculations in according to the model, and that follows the, the um, remuneration policy, yes. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. The next issue is whether mutual separation agreements concluded in 2017 and 2018 with senior executives of the PIC complied with internal policies of the PIC and whether payouts made for this purpose were prudent. Commissioner, if I can just maybe deal with that. We sort of touched on earlier on this morning around that. The um, mutual agreement generally become an outcome of a disciplinary hearing. And, and I think it's common cause that in any disciplinary or a dispute, um, you might seek for a resolution of that dispute. So in most cases, it will either be advanced by a disputing party or it could be initiated by the chairperson of, of, of the hearing. And in this instance, um, um, this specific issue of this mutual agreement that was dealt with in, in 2017-18 um, was focused and initiated um, as part of the discussion between the parties. So that would be the uh, employee representative and the employer representative. So the chairperson of the hearing indicated if whether the parties are amenable um, to resolving the dispute at, at that point in time. Um, then obviously that's a matter that was considered by both parties. Uh, I was the employer representative in that case uh, in point, delegated um, by the CEO at the time. I then informed that um, are we amenable to a mutual separation discussion, as it were. Then indicated, Chris, there's no uh, harm in exploring that alternative. Let's see how it goes. And from that basis, you know, it was made in, in good faith, and uh, both parties part participated, and voluntarily so, and had legal representation, and, and, and then the mutual agreement was concluded. What is the position with the, the CEO that left the PIC end of last year. Is there a, a mutual separation agreement? Not that I'm aware, I'm aware of, no. 
then 1.14, whether the PIC followed due and proper process in 2017 and 18 in the appointment of senior executive heads and senior managers, whether on a permanent or fixed term contracts. Um, Commissioner, I think I dealt with this uh, aspect. I may not have necessarily mentioned that, but just to, to go back to that, um, I've dealt with the recruitment process as well. And I think in this respect, it will deal with senior manager. And I mentioned the role of general manager investment management, uh, which was then converted into the executive head investment management. Um, that role was redundant and we had followed due processes with regards to submission made to um, the HRRC as well as the board uh, in respect of this specific position and uh, the necessary approvals were obtained. In this instance, you know, the position became redundant and elevated to the executive head. The employee in that role and the incumbent in that role was um, absorbed and, and this is not an extraordinary process. So in instances where there are elements of um, what you would call section 189 or elements where the person is declared redundant, the first point is to absorb a person that's a, a, in, in that position. However, considering whether they meet the minimum requirements of that, so we've done it before as well. So there's nothing untoward as far as that's concerned. Thank you. Can you then proceed with disciplinary proceedings? Just a question, uh, ju just before you go. Um, you mentioned that there were challenges with bonuses uh, within the PIC. Were they, the challenges, were they just the bonus pool issue or there were individual issues of, on, on the bonuses side? I might need to get clarification in terms of individual issues. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, the challenges were they, was the problem only within the bonus pool issues between the shareholder and the PIC? Or were there problems in terms of allocations to individuals uh, within the PIC? Okay, thanks, Commissioner, for clarifying. So I may take you maybe to page nine um, on that table two. So if you look at page nine, table two, you'll notice 2015, 16, 2016, 17, and 2017, 18. You'll see the values of the bonus pool allocated. Ordinarily, and I think it's common cause and human behavior that as and when we improve our performance, we expect a higher point. No, Leah, I'm at work. I'm in Pretoria. Okay, I'll talk to you just now. All right. Um, so you're just going to prompt me, hey? Yeah. Can you call Land Yeah, let me call Land Report uh, because you uh, please move slightly this way.